Welcome to Walk on Perspective. I am your host, Robert Boswell. We are WO Perspective on Twitter and Walk on Perspective on Facebook and Instagram. We are very pleased to announce that we are joined today by Stanley Berryhill. Uh, before we get started, I was hoping you could break down your journey of how you got to where you are. I know you're from Tucson, Arizona. You're obviously proud to represent your home city. I know that you started out in high school there in Tucson. You then went to Southern California, where you attended high school to kind of raise your profile. And it ended up working because you bet on yourself. And here you are today, team captain leading receiver representing your team at, at Pac-12 Media Days obviously right. it has paid off so I want you to give us an idea of who is Stanley Berryhill and where did you come from uh yeah so I was born in Oklahoma moved here to Tucson Arizona when I was one and uh, as soon as I got here I started throwing the ball around with my dad and my dad saw that I love sports so as soon as I was old enough to play sports, he uh, put me in football, basketball, baseball, track, you name it. I played for a Pop Warner team called the Tucson Falcons. We have a couple players in the NFL, a, couple, a lot of players that play in college. And just my whole life, I was always technically like the underdog, never was given the respect that I thought I deserved and stuff like that. It wasn't really until maybe last year where people started recognizing who I grew up with, how good of a player that I was and or a good of a player I could be. So, I mean, yeah, I've just been in Tucson my whole life, moved to California my senior year, played at Orange Lutheran in the Trinity League, played against a lot of great competition, hoping to receive some Division One scholarships. I had one to South Dakota State, and they ended up pulling it right before the start of my senior year. And then... I uh, committed to ASU as a walk-on for a couple of weeks and then ended up talking to Rich Rod and he got me here at U of A, which was where I wanted to be. And the rest is history. I mean, I started as a walk-on, battled a couple injuries throughout the through my freshman year and got put on scholarship my sophomore year. And then after that, I I played here and there, played in 37, 38 games straight without missing any games. So Hopefully I could keep that going. And now I'm just trying to be the best football player I can be every week. No doubt. You mentioned it right there. Came in 2017 playing for Coach Rich Rodriguez. You walked on, you redshirt that season. And then after the end of that season, there was a coaching staff turnover. You had thought at the time about hanging up the cleats. Talk to us about kind of where you were at at that time. Who was guiding you at that time? Why you ultimately decided to come back, give it a go with the new coaching staff at the time. Kevin Sumlin comes in. What was that moment in your life like? And how did you persevere to be able to overcome all the struggles that you were going with in that 2017 season? Yeah, I mean, it was rough at first. I was I was taking two reps in uh, fall camp, and I ended up cracking my kneecap, and I was out for a month, so then they just ended up redshirting me. And then after that, I just faced, like, little nagging injuries. I had a couple concussions my first year, uh, AC joint, a couple sprained ankles. So I just uh, – after after Rich Rod got fired, I was – I wanted to go back and try to give baseball a try again and – go to the JUCOs around in Arizona that are known for having good baseball programs. And I contacted them and it was all go from there. And uh, then I talked to my dad about it and he wasn't too fond with the decision that I was making to stop playing football and leaving here. He told me that I have everything I want in front of me, just got to keep my head down and work. And uh, he didn't talk to me for a couple of days because he was upset with the decision I was going to make, but at the end of the day, I talked to him and I decided to stay and it ended up paying off. So I thank him for pushing me to keep playing football and not not giving up on playing football. You were a pretty highly recruited baseball athlete in high school. What ultimately made you choose football from the get go? Well, football has always been like my most natural sport and my main sport that I've played the longest in my life. I know that you can't get full ride scholarships in baseball and I didn't want my parents to have to come out 
of pocket too much. And they told me uh, my my senior year of high school when we we're making the decision on what I was going to do for college that I have one year to earn a scholarship and they'll pay for one year. And if if I don't, then I'm going to have to take out loans myself and pay for the rest of until I do earn a scholarship. So it was a goal for me to earn a scholarship within a year of being on whatever team I um, played for. And it ended up happening that way. And I earned a scholarship after my first season. So it was, it worked out, but it was a crazy ride. Rewind back to the start of that 2018 season, uh, new coaching staff comes in. You don't know them from Adam, uh, Kevin Sumlin, you probably knew of him from his time at Texas A&M. Uh, they come in and then I think it's before summer workout started, they must have liked something that they had seen from you. Uh, they had awarded you with a scholarship. You earned a scholarship. Walk us through what that moment was like. Did you know it was coming? Did they surprise you in a team meeting? Uh, yeah, I got surprised in a team meeting on the last day of fall camp. So we ended up, we had spring ball with them. I think I played pretty well during that spring ball. Was one of the leading receivers in the spring camp. Went through summer workouts. I had a feeling that I was going to be put on scholarship. I just didn't know when. I figured it was going to be in December because I felt like that was when our seniors were going to leave and scholarships would open up. I didn't know we had any available at the time. So I, I knew that it was coming. I just didn't know exactly when I was going to get it, if it was going to be after the 2018 season or after the 2018 school year. I didn't know when it was going to be. So we were we're all in our team meeting and we're going through all the things that we had to do before the start of the season. And the last day of camp at the end of the meeting, he puts up a slide and it says, Stanley Berryhill, you are now on scholarship. I'm just like sitting there reading it. And before I could even process what was going on, just everybody was jumping on me. and It was crazy. It was a surreal moment. I'll probably never forget it. And it's just, it was just insane. How long did it take after that moment for that to set in that all your hard work and betting on yourself and finally earning that scholarship from your home school, your, your hometown, the school you grew up idolizing, how long did it take before it kind of set in that, wow, I, I really did it. I made it. It took a couple of weeks. Like I wasn't used to it at first because uh, you get stipends. So I didn't get my first stipend because it was after the first time so I didn't get the first check that everyone else got when school started and I ended up getting two checks like two and a half three weeks later and that's when it finally hit me and I was like man I'm on scholarship and I'm, I, I called my parents and they cried and it was it was it was crazy who had the bigger reaction mom or dad my dad my dad because he knew he's he was my coach my whole life and he coached me all throughout high school up until my senior year and trained with him in the off season. And so when he found out, I think he was just as much awe that I, as I was. My mom, she was really happy too. I think she cried, but she's very sensitive. So she cries over everything, but it was, it was just, it was incredible. The whole family, you could feel the emotion in the whole family. It's such an incredible success story, Stanley. It's rare where you get to meet somebody who grew up in the town that they end up playing for, idolizing that team, aren't recruited initially or kind of looked over, maybe had a couple looks elsewhere, but then bet on themselves, ends up earning the opportunity to make the team after having to relocate, gain more exposure, and then ultimately the hard work finally pays off in year two, earning that scholarship. It had to give you such a confidence boost to know that not only did you belong, but that you were going to go on to do bigger and better things. Yeah, it was it was just crazy because I know a lot of people in town and when people see me out, it, it's just – there's a lot of people that I didn't know knew who I was. And over the last couple of years, I started realizing how many fans Arizona football has and how many people know who I am. So it's just crazy. Nowadays, I bet you can't walk into anywhere in Tucson and not be recognized. One, having grown up there, but now not only having earned a scholarship, you've also been given the number one, which at Arizona is kind of a big deal. And then additionally been named a team captain 
leading the team in receptions as we sit here today, the time of this recording, I think you're only 34 receptions shy of the all time school record for receptions in a season. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure people are going to know the name Barry Hill by the time it's all said and done. I hope so. I just leave my mark on the program after this year, and next year, and just see what happens. And hopefully I'm known for a long time around here. In addition to all of those accolades, earlier you were actually named the team representative to be at the Pac-12 Media Days. What was that honor like for you, and what did that mean for you? I mean, it's incredible. It just shows that all my hard work has been paying off and that Coach Fish and the coaching staff trust me to say things about our program and on a, on a big stage when we have a lot of different reporters from different from different teams and different areas of like ESPN, Fox Sports, all that kind of stuff. So it was a nice honor to be able to do that. And I would wish for anybody who plays college football to be able to be, do that for their team. Your wide receiver coach, Coach Cummings, he kind of describes you as a different cat. He <laughs> says that you're always smiles and wouldn't have picked a better person to have represented the team at Pac-12 Media Days. He's obviously a big fan of yours, so whatever you're doing in position meetings and in position drills, it, it's, it's obviously showing. Yeah, I just try to come with the, the right attitude and a lot of energy every day. I try to think about everything being positive instead of being negative, because there's a lot of negative in the world, but I just try to stay positive as much as possible and uplift the people around me. So that's what I try to do with my energy. So I'm always happy. That energy is obviously been infectious coming into this week for our listeners who would like a little bit more context. At the time that we were recording this, we are only three days removed from the first victory for Arizona in almost two and a half years, it has been 763 long days. You snapped a 20-game losing streak with a 10-3 to victory over California. I bet you guys didn't care if it was 2-0, to zero, as long as it said Arizona with the dub at the end of the game. I hope y'all celebrated like it was the dang Super Bowl, Stanley. Oh, yeah, we did. It was, it was insane. It was incredible. The coaches were going crazy after the game, the players, the fans, everyone wanted it. And we finally got it. And if I was to tell you that we're going to be 0-8 this year going into that, or 0-7 going into that game, I don't, I wouldn't have believed it. And I don't think anybody on the team would have believed it. So when we finally got the win, we saw that all of our hard work has been paying off because we put in so much work as a team and it's finally starting to show. And it was just, it was insane. It was incredible. It was an incredible feeling. How much of a weight is it off of your shoulders? It's got to feel like now that we've got that first one in our pocket, now it, it's almost like they're just going to start coming in waves. That first one had to just be that big hurdle. And now it's easier to show up early to practice, show up early to meetings, put in that extra work after practice because you see it paying off. And what Coach Fish promised when he came in, when he said, we're going to change the culture, we're going to make football fun again. You now see there's some legitimacy there. There is now some fruits of all of that labor. It's got to give you motivation and energy going into this week of preparation. Oh, yeah, of course. You could just tell by the buzz around the facility and how everyone carries himself now and in the weight room. Everyone's showing up to the training room for extra recovery and extra rehab and stuff like that. So you could tell that it has been a weight lifted off of our shoulders and everybody wants it more than ever right now. So we're going to have a strong week and just prepare for uh, the game against Utah. A, a big challenge coming up. I know it's one that you're looking forward to. Cool. I'm curious, you're a little bit smaller frame for a wide receiver. There's a lot of people out there projecting you to uh, certain rounds in the upcoming NFL draft. I wanted to know, who do you model your game after? Is there a wide receiver that you idolize or you watch film and you say, hey, he's kind of got a similar frame, similar skill set to me. Is there anybody out there who you try to model? Yeah, I look at the 
I like Deshaun Jackson growing up because he's he's super fast. He's not too big of a receiver, and he makes things happen with his feet. But I like I watch a lot of film on Julian Edelman, Danley Amendola, like receivers like that who played in the same type of offense that we use now here at U of A. Right now, I've been watching a lot of Cooper Cup because he plays the same position I play, and Coach Fish has a good relationship with him and the Raiders offensive players. So I just try to watch, I mean, the Rams offensive players. So I just try to watch the Rams receivers, the Patriots receivers, the Bengals receivers, because those are, are the Seattle receivers. Those are the receivers that uh, are running the same type of routes that I'm running. So it's not just one guy. I study quite a few different receivers just so I could pick and take things from different players. Every one of those guys you just mentioned, one, are tremendous at their craft, but two, are, are known as chain movers. Do you pride yourself, Stanley, on when it's third and we've got to have it? You want to be the guy? Like Your team knows they can count on you, and you're coming down with that ball, and you're going to move those chains. Yes, sir. I try to. I try. I know I've noticed and realized that that's one thing that I have gotten pretty good at is just being able to be in the right spot at the right time on third down and executing the route. So yeah, I take pride, a lot of pride in being the third down and trying to move the chains, even if it's not third down or whenever I get the ball, that's just aim to get a first down. And if I could get more then I could get more, but getting the first down is the first thing on my mind, making someone miss and uh, picking up a couple of extra yards. Obviously, you've got that clutch gene. You showed it on tape. Is there a particular part of your game that you think is probably your best skill set? Is it your route running? Is it your film prep? Is it your speed? Maybe it's your hands. Is it your physicality? What do you pride yourself most on? I would say just making every catch. Uh, so I would say I have pretty reliable hands, uh, I would say. And then just trying to get yakky yards after the catch. If I catch the ball at one yard, let's try to pick up five or six more. And so it's second and two or third and two or just trying to make someone miss. That's just one thing I pride myself on. And I think I've done a pretty good job at in the last couple of years, just making the first guy miss. Cause if you can make the first guy miss, there's normally a good amount of field to work with. So that's what I try to do. It, it's obviously uh, working out in your favor with the way the season is going and the season that you are having personally. And with that win this past week, I, I just know that that's going to open the floodgates and they're just going to come in waves now. And uh, I know your team is going to feed off of that infectious energy that you've got. I want to backtrack a little bit if we can, Stanley, going back to that 2017 season, you're struggling with – you know, do I want to continue playing ball? If if I do, do I want it to be here at Arizona? We we don't know who the coach is going to be. Rich Rod just left. I want to know at that time in your life, who was it that was in your? I know you said your dad was so instrumental. Was it you had some people there in the university? You had you know family, your friends. Who is it that? really was instrumental in keeping you on track and keeping the faith, knowing that, hey, Stanley, like, you you definitely are going to be something special. You just got to gut it out. Yeah, I would say just my parents, my grandparents and my two older sisters. I mean, they support me in regardless of whatever I do. And they've always known that I've been the underdog and they've always seen how good I was growing up and not getting the recognition I deserve. So just having them in my corner and then telling me everything's going to be okay and whatever decision I made, they would support it. I mean, my grandpa texts me after every game and kind of gives me, he like analyzes the game while he watches it and like kind of sends me a long paragraph telling me what I need to work on or what the team did well and what we need to work on and stuff like that. So I would say those six people, my two sisters, my parents and my grandparents are just who I leaned on on that in that time and trying to make decisions and trying to figure out uh, what was going to be best for me. Between that moment in time we're referencing with the help of all of your loved ones there between that time. And then that next spring, when you said your play on the field is what helped earn you a scholarship with, with that next staff. Was there a moment in that spring uh, or maybe a combination of moments where you truly realized, Hey, I definitely have something special here. And not only do I belong, but I know I'm going to earn a scholarship and I'm going to be something special. 
Uh, yeah, I would have to say it was probably the 2018 spring game. I mean, that was the first time I scored on U of A's field that wasn't like in front of people. And it was like a little bubble screen and I made three or four guys miss. And I took the ball for maybe 31 yards and scored. And so I think that's when in my mind it clicked. And then after that, that's when everyone was telling me like, oh, you need to be on scholarship. Hopefully they put you on scholarship. And then they ended up putting me on scholarship a couple months later. And that was that was really it. It's incredible. A testament to your character, which is really what this show is all about. Just detailing not only the walk on success stories, but what makes up the mentality of the walk on player with a lot of them similar to yourself going on to earning that scholarship. We're sitting here about a week after the 2021 Burlesworth award nominations were put out and I'm sure you saw it. Yours was on that list of nominees as to possibly win the 2021 Burlesworth award for context for our listeners who don't know what that is goes to the player in college football who started their career as a walk-on who has gone on to have success both on and off the field started back in 2010 for Brandon Burlesworth. If we won't rehash all of that here, but if you're curious about that story and that, that award, you can check out the Burlesworth trust and uh, they have a movie called greater, which is a fantastic movie about Brandon Burlesworth. I encourage those out there to go in and watch that and familiarize themselves with that story. I say all that because I wanted to know when that was put out this week, what did that mean for you to one, see yourself with that recognition, having been nominated for that, and then additionally knowing what that trophy means and who it's named after, what did that mean for you, Stanley? I mean, it was an incredible honor. I mean, I've been telling myself for the last couple of years that I want to be nominated for that and I want to win that award. So when I was, was told that I was being nominated for it. It was just, I was, I was super happy, but I knew there was more work to be done. And so, I mean, it's incredible honor. Uh, hopefully by the end of my playing career, I could win that award and um, represent the Bullsworth trophy. Cause I know there's been a lot of incredible players like Hunter Renfro, Baker Mayfield, Luke Falk, all those people who are very good players that I've seen play and, being in the, the list with those players would be an incredible honor. I'm curious, having grown up there in Tucson, you're an Arizona native, is safe to assume that growing up you were a fan of the Cardinals? Yeah, a little bit here and there. I, now I'm more into the Cardinals now just because I like to represent where I'm from, so I like to cheer on the home state teams and stuff like that. But, yeah, I've, I've watched the Cardinals a little bit. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, the the success that they're enjoying this season is really unprecedented in the last decade or so since that last Super Bowl appearance with Kurt Warner and Larry Fitzgerald, who oddly is still there. Yeah, uh, I'm, I assume, though, your next favorite team is going to be the one that hopefully you get to suit up for at the next level. Is that safe to assume? That is safe to assume. All right. Well, we'll we'll keep our fingers crossed that maybe we can just keep that journey close to home. And maybe if the Arizona Cardinals scouts are listening, it may be time to <laughs> take an eye at, at Stanley here. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stanley, uh, I appreciate you taking time to sit down and talk with us today, get to learn a little bit about you, your personality, your journey. I wanted to give you an opportunity for our listeners. Where can they find you and follow you if they want to keep up with you and your story? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at uh, StanB14 underscore SB. And on Instagram, it's just StanB14. Awesome stuff. Well, as we sign off here, Stanley, uh, is there a, a rallying cry or a chant that Arizona does that we can finish off here? Uh, yeah, there's, we have a fight song and then we have a saying, it's just bear down, go cats. Let's, let, let's finish with your best bear down, go cats for our listeners. Bear down, go cats.
That's awesome stuff. Yes, sir. Well, Stanley, thank you again for spending time with us today. Good luck to you and the rest of your team the remainder of this season. We're definitely going to be fans. I, I can't wait to watch what's next for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Again, big thank you to Stanley for joining the show today. His story is such an inspirational one. Getting to play for the team that he grew up idolizing right there in Tucson, Arizona, and earning that scholarship and keeping the faith and his infectious energy, always being in a good mood, being a team leader with both what he says and what he does on and off the field, with all of the struggles that U of A had gone through leading up to this season with the losing streak, he kept that infectious positivity throughout all of it. And finally, when the fruits of their labor culminated with that victory over California, all of the players on that team, you had to know, looked to him as that guiding personality, that guiding leader, because he always is consistent. He is just uh, the model of positivity for his team. What I want our listeners to take away is no matter how difficult things seem to be in your life with whatever it is that you're going through, stay positive. Just keep your nose to the grindstone. Keep putting in work each and every day. Bring that positive mindset. Be a good positive influence to all of those around you because you never know who is watching, who is listening, who is paying attention, and how you can help somebody who is going through something just by your own emotion or your your own personality, the way you carry yourself. What I want you to do is start to each and every morning, think about how my emotions, how my way I carry myself, what I say, what I do, my mannerisms, how can that be a positive influence both for those close around me, but those who are looking to me to be a leader. That's going to do it today for this episode of Walk On Perspective. Again, as you do each and every week, thank you so very much for listening. It means the world to us. Thank you to those who have left a review, who have rated our show, who have taken the time to do that. I implore you to please go and do that if you haven't. If you enjoyed today's episode or you feel like somebody could really benefit from having heard it, I I encourage you to send it to them, post it on social media. For sponsorship opportunities for our show, please email me at robert at walkonperspective.com. Thank you again, and God bless.